Hi, hello. Uh, my name's Arnau, and I'm a nuclear physicist. That doesn't generally go very well at parties. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but today I'm not here to talk about the atomic nucleus, the tiny object at the center of the atom uh, that defines the elements that we find around us. Today I'm here to talk about neutron stars and why these are objects that redefine our ordinary understanding of astronomy and astrophysics. Now before I move into neutron stars though, I also need to talk about an extraordinary event that occurred just two weeks ago. If you were paying attention at the news two weeks ago, you would have seen something like this. Uh, the Laser Interferometry Gravitational Observatory, LIGO, announced the detection, the first direct detection of gravitational waves. This was an event that looks like the video on the right-hand side in there. Two black holes of around 30 times as heavy as the Sun each collided and merged, creating an even larger black hole in just a fraction of a second. So that movie was slow down version. The power output of this event, to put it into context, was larger than the power output of all the stars in the universe. It was really extraordinary. Now, there's several reasons why this event is important. There's a technological aspect to it. There's the understanding of astrophysics that it brings forward. We didn't know before that two of these black holes could collide, and we didn't know how often they would do it. But really, uh, why this event matters is because it opens a new, windows into, a new window into the way that we look at the universe. Let me give you an example of how the universe looks when you look at it, instead of with your own eyes, with different kinds of eyes. Um, what you can see here is the Crab Nebula. The Crab Nebula on the top right corner, that's how you would see it with a telescope, with the binoculars, if you're lucky enough, not with your own eyes. The Crab Nebula sits in a place in the sky where Chinese astronomers in 1054 detected the presence of a new star. And we think that was a supernova explosion, the cataclysmic event at the end of the lifetime of a star, leaving behind in sight and at the middle a tiny, tiny neutron star. When you look at... Uh, the Crab Nebula, with your own eyes, you see a beautiful, colorful nebula. When you look at the Crab Nebula, though, with other eyes, for instance, looking at the most energetic events, like X-rays, you see things like the picture on the center down here, which shows a tiny object with flows of matter and incoming, inspiraling um, accretion disks. So it's a completely different picture. You see something extraordinarily different. The same way if you look at it in ultraviolet light, in infrared, or in the radio spectrum. We don't know yet how the Crab Nebula looks like in gravitational waves, but when we do, I'm sure we're gonna find something extraordinary. If you want um, an analogy to this, imagine that suddenly, one day, you lose one of your five senses, let's say hearing. You would stop listening to music, hearing people speak, um, you would miss a lot out of the universe that surrounds you. And if by chance suddenly you got hearing back, let's say while you're walking in a station and you could suddenly hear the crowds, the noise of the trains, the announcements, the radio, the music, you would feel incredibly excited. That's how excited a physicist feels when a new window is opened to look at the universe. Because we are going to see completely new dimension of the events in astrophysics and in the universe. Now, since we're talking about hearing, it turns out that we can also listen to the Crab Nebula. You just point a radio telescope to the Crab Nebula, plug it to your usual radio, and listen to it. Let's, let's see how that sounds like. It's a terrible sound. <laughs> I th we expected music, but we got this instead. Um, so what did we, if, if you paid attention there, you could see a repeating high pitch, high pitch frequency sound, more or less like a car motor. This was a 500, about 500 hertz signal 
And the reason that you heard that is that the neutron star at the center of the Crab Nebula is actually rotating. It's a bit like a lighthouse. Uh, neutron stars have the largest magnetic fields in the universe and the particles trapped on those magnetic fields emit light along the north and the south pole of the star in a very, very narrow um, beam. If, that the, if the neutron star is rotating and that beam happens to sweep across the Earth, you would hear a beep. And if that happens at a frequency of 500 hertz, you will hear the sound that you've just heard of the Crab Nebula. So it's really extraordinary. We can see these massive magnetic fields and these sounds coming from objects in the sky. Now, why do neutron stars, why are neutron stars so extraordinary? Okay, let's look at their properties. In terms of mass, neutron stars are very massive. They're very massive to our standards, but they are more or less as massive as a normal star. So a neutron star weights more or less the same as the sun. That's to say about 500,000 <coughs> Earths. So it's a pretty heavy object, but it's just in the right scale that we would expect for a normal star. Now, what makes neutron stars extraordinary objects is that they are tiny. They are very small. The radius of a neutron star is just about 10 kilometers. In comparison, the radius of the Earth is 6,000, so 600 times larger. The radius of the Sun is almost a million. So it's a, more, a much larger object. Neutron stars are tiny, and they have tons, large amounts of mass inside of them. Just to give you an idea of how tiny that object is, this is my commute every day from London into Guildford. You could fit two neutron stars in there. It would be a bad idea because the density is so large and the gravitational field is so large <laughs> that you would probably be crunched immediately, but still, you could put one of those in there. Now, the density, the density if you make the ratio of the mass over the volume of that star, the density that comes out is, again, a very large number, a weigh spoon, uh, a teaspoon of that material would weigh about a billion tons. And it's very difficult to picture what that means, because even the more dense materials on Earth, like gold, are just uh, 10 to the 13 orders of 10 to the 13 times less dense than that, so one followed by 13 zeros less dense than that. There's only one other place in the universe where you actually find these extremely large densities, and that's at the interior of the atomic nucleus, the systems that I study every day where you have neutrons and protons interacting in a very, very tiny space, again, putting a lot of mass in a very small place gives you a very large density. So in principle, if I know how neutrons and protons behave inside of a nucleus, I can also figure out how neutrons behave surrounded by a crowd of neutrons and how they, for instance, make a neutron star. That's why I can make the connection between the smallest, one of the smallest objects of the universe, the nucleus, and one of an extraordinary astrophysical object like a neutron star. Now, on the 11th of February, as a physicist, as a lecturer in physics, I was extraordinarily excited. I was thrilled. This opened a new window to the universe. What we could see with, what we will see with gravitational waves will be extraordinarily for sure. As a nuclear physicist, though, on the 11th of February, I was slightly disappointed. The reason I was disappointed is that because, for all we know, in terms of astrophysics, how our galaxy works, how stars live their lives, we expected that the first event that we would see would be with the same likelihood, either a black hole, black hole binary, like we observed, or a neutron star, neutron star binary. And obviously, as a nuclear physicist, I would have preferred to see two neutron stars colliding <laughs> rather than two black holes. Now, that's not only because I like neutrons, but that's also because I would have learned, we would have learned a lot of the properties of these objects from this collision. We could have figured out their masses with better precision, possibly their radii with better precision too. But there's another reason why neutron star, neutron star collisions or mergers matter. Um, and I think it's better if we see a movie of one of these events to explain it. 
Right, so there you have two neutron stars colliding. Um, they rotate around each other, and as you can see, they shed a lot of mass around. The center is a very dense object that eventually will evolve into a black hole, but all the material around the in spiral is being ejected into the astronomical medium. Now, this is very hot. The color code in here is temperature. So this is hot material. And these are two neutron stars, so this is neutron-rich material. And as nuclear physicists, we know that to explain the existence and the presence of the elements that are heavier than iron, think about gold, platinum, mercury, lead, all those elements are not produced in normal stars. They have to be produced in cataclysmic events with large amounts of energy and large amounts of neutrons. And we believe that the neutron star mergers could be one of those places. So if we could get the gravitational wave signal coming from one of those mergers, and we could also observe it, say, with light, we would learn so much, not only about the gravitational interaction between these two objects, but also about the nuclear physics and the processes that create the elements that make us and make the Earth. That is a prospect that really excites me. And that's why I was so disappointed on February the 11th. Well, to close on, I want to show you a picture. This is how a pulsar looks like. These are the pulses coming, the radio pulses coming from a specific object. And perhaps you don't recognize that image, but if I actually invert it, those of you who love vinyls might actually see that this is the cover of Joy Division's famous album unknown pleasures. It's a beautiful example of what happens when you mix science with art. But I also want to, but what I want to take out of it is the measure, is the message of unknown pleasures. Working at the forefront of research, be it in nuclear physics, in gravitational waves, in astrophysics, in any field actually, provides an immense amount of joy. You always find new ideas, extraordinary events that really give an immense amount of unknown intellectual pleasures. Thank you.